All right. This is August slash, I guess, slash September. Um, anime. Classic anime. Actually, top five anime of all times. Uh, my name is Matt Keed. Gaming, anime, manga. That's what I do. And to shorten this video so it doesn't become long. And for those who have never seen any of these animes, I'll just make it as fast as I possibly can and short and sweet as I possibly can and keep my opinions thereafter at the end. So this is kind of August slash September. And I could only do an August slash slash September because uh, in September I'm going to be very busy. So I thought to myself, I want an August anime primarily for August, but I want one from for September as well because I'm going to be busy in September. So here it is. This is five best anime of all times. And they still hold up to this very day. And they will hold up for the next 10 years or probably the next 20 years. Um, when you're talking top echelon anime, these will always be in the top five. Or at least four of them will be in the top five. And I guess the fifth one, you could transition that out to be your top five. Whatever you want in the fifth place. But the first four will always be in the top five. And that's not based on opinion. That's based on evidence and fandom and uh, various countries and various beliefs and various opinions and majority over minority. Um, and based primarily on majority over minority in various different countries, as well as the U.S., um, that's how it goes. You know, if someone says, well, I don't give a damn what another country thinks. I live in this country. It's like, you're just one country out of many country who have this belief of the anime you chose to be in your top five. I do this based on international belief, not based on single-minded individuals who are, you know, who cares what anyone else thinks? Um, this is a majority over minority rule for anime. So, without further ado, these are the top five based on fandom. Based on my personal opinion as well, which I put to the end of everything without, after I factor everything that's considered by a mass audience on a worldwide scale. Top five. That's been uh, works for years in manga and is still going in manga and has existed on the big screen, toys, animation, school products, educational films, you name it. The only thing that these characters in these animes and mangas have never crossed with regards to a threshold is science law and I guess no I wouldn't say yeah science law and uh, cooking possibly cooking these specific top five anyway and why I say these because um, everything in this in these animes have touched on a topic with these various fields before, with, with other various fields before, except for these three, and have educationally spoke on various different fields in various different education in the world within these animes. So actually, there's one of them, and it's social work. I keep forgetting that. Sometimes you could look over social work because, um, you know, it's, it's not something that everyone does anyway. So that's another thing. And no, doctors are, are considered because subject matters with regards to health and caring of one's health and that type of stuff have been emphasized within this anime as well. And how to treat wounds and how to survive and how to police a state. And how to survive in the wilderness and how to uh, graduate from college and all that stuff and how to uh, escape when you're trapped how to excel past your potential 
how to build muscles or how to build your brains or how to escape um, certain scenarios when it's critical, how to evolve as a human being, how to evolve as the human race, how to better oneself, how to better one's mind, how to better one's psyche, how to better one's financial gain. Everything in these top five animes have emphasized on every type of job in the world. Not to the point of they're the go-tos for education. They're more like the 15 to 25 cent marker with regards to what you learn in various different fields applied within anime. Other things, no. Besides those things, the entertainment value is the main thing. The fun factor is the main thing. If you don't take something out of these animes, you won't get anything out of these animes. So they have to be good to last this long years down the road. So I'll start off as quick as I possibly can. The first one is the number one on my list. And it will always be the number one on my list. And that's Hunter Hunter. Why not One Piece? I said it before and I'll say it again. There are certain things that are questionable in One Piece, just like there are questionable things in any anime. Or most animes that are tailored are primarily for boys, or primarily for girls, or for everyone else. There will always be questionable things. But to me, to, to me um, Hunter x Hunter has the least of those questionable things. Except, except for one or two things. So having one or two questionable things in your anime compared to many animes that have many questionable things, I think that's fair. One of them is a character called Hisoka. And I'm pretty sure you can understand the reason why I say that is once I get into this. So this is Hunter x Hunter, the very first of these animes. And I consider this the best because based on everything I've just said, it touched on every single subject matter in the world except for the one that I didn't point out um, you know uh, human resources within uh, uh, I guess a human uh, I don't know a, a department of labor or something like that or science like science level science or that you would find something like Dr. Stone or a law that you would find within the courts or maybe something that I haven't touched on yet, that this anime has not touched on itself. But majority of any type of job you could possibly think of has been applied at a certain point or other in this game. Or, I should I say, not in this game, but Hunter x Hunter was made a game as well, but in this anime specifically. And so, like I said, without further ado, I'm going to get into it, because I don't want this to be... Uh, theoretical discussion about my favorite anime um, or of my favorite animes so this is Hunter x Hunter this is the location is called Whale Island and on this Whale Island is actually looks like a whale it's the design of this whale and the primarily uh, the primary goal to this um, top five is to identify why they're considered top five and why they're top five and why should you should watch it so as I'm getting into it as I go through each image to represent each story or part of each arc, I'll give reasons to why every now and again during those step process to why these top five are the greatest top five of enemies of all times. The next image is our main protagonist, Gon. And part of Hunter Hunter, he's the main saucy ingredient. There's a story to everything, and everything must have a story. Like a plains, you must have rocks on the plains, you must have hills on the plains, and mountains that are on the plains. But everything starts from a foundation and a ground. And every foundation and every ground is a flat surface. And on those flat surfaces, you have contours and concaves on those flat surfaces. Character like Gon is a representation of contours and conclaves on that flat surface. The story itself, the, the story of all stories themselves, falls on the flat surface. And from that flat surface, there are different cutout sections or borders. 
and those borders could have different colors to represent what they are. But the flat surface represents the entire story from beginning, middle, and end. Gone is a representation of a character that appear on that flat surface. Moving on from Gone, from where he is within the story, you then see Gone catch a gigantic fish. And in the story of Hunter Hunter, this fish is considered to be a legendary fish. No one catch it, at least no one that's a, a child that is, or even adults can't catch this fish. Moving on from that, then get to the next image, and this character is Gon's um, aunt, Aunt Mido. And she's a very important character in Hunter Hunter, and I will state that later on. Well, I could state it right now. She's a representation of Gon, who's the child of a legendary hunter. And this legendary hunter is someone that left the island of Wheel Island a long time ago when he grew up as a kid. He passed a hunter examination, graduated, never been seen again. And Mito has been raising Gon ever since. So she's an important factor with regards to his maturity as well as his journey throughout the Hunter Hunter universe. And this is why I don't like scrolling up sometimes. It skips certain things. So moving on from Aunt Mito, go down to the next image. We see a kid named Kropka. And his name is Kropika because he's, well, that's the name that he was given. I don't exactly know the reason why he's called Kropika, but I just know the reason why the people who created the manga call him Kropika. Kropika is a strategist. Kropika is uh, uh, kind of conceited. Kropika is kind of full of himself sometimes. Kropika is very intelligent. Kropika is like the guy you want on your team to be the one to solve the puzzle in order to get yourself out of a sticky situation. Kropika, Kropika is also can be considered uh, 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 transgender. I don't know if it's fully, that's fully true, but I'm assuming based on later throughout the, the manga, um, it's stated that Kropika, Kropika is not identified as either male or woman. Um, you just assume Kropika is male because he hangs out with dudes or she hangs out with dudes. And the description for Kropika's gender was never pointed out. It was never brought up because it was never the essential point of Kropika's existence. His sexuality was never something to be considered or even point out. And since simply because the, the writers and the, the artists decide not to point that out because that wasn't relevant to Kropika's existence or Gon's existence or Killua's existence or Leorio's existence, um, it wasn't something that was of any relevance whatsoever. However, as Hunter Hunter went along, Kropika became a fan favorite to many. And so people wanted to know more about Kropika. Eventually, they found out that Kropika is not actually a dude. Um, but even I don't know if that's fully true. And even many people don't know if that's fully true. We're assuming that Kropika is a woman hiding to be a man. But since it's never been revealed that she's, and I could call Kropika a she, um, fully revealed that he's a she, well, in, I guess in scenes that show that she has, you know, lady parts and stuff, there's n and this Hunter Hunter would never show that whatsoever at all, um, you have to assume that the she is something that's purely in your mind, and you have to label Kropika as a she. But since the writers and uh, the creators of the manga never pointed it out, she could possibly still be a he. That's why I say Kropika could possibly be transgender. Moving on from that, you get to Leorio, and Leorio has always been Leorio. I'll just leave it at that. The big mouth guy who's smart mouth, who wants money to save his friends, or to, to save his life, if it ever comes down to the same situation that happened with his friend. And if you have money, you could solve any problems in the world. That's Leorio's, Leorio's philosophy. However, that's not the real Leorio. The real Leorio is the person who wants to actually save people from dying. 
because he's going to be a doctor. That's his main pursuit, to be a doctor so he could save people from dying and things that happen to his friend does not happen to everyone else. So he needs that currency in order to see his dream come to life. The next scene we see is Kropika on the boat with Leorio, both of them having an argument. Leorio said something bad about Kropika's people. Kropika says, take it back. They get into a little argument. They go on top of the, on the deck of the ship. And during this process, they get into a hand-to-hand -hand combat fight with knives and, and whatever it is that they were using. And another thing to point out about Hunter x Hunter, Hunter x Hunter is really not an anime for kids, to be honest with you. Yes, kids could watch it. It's not like this is Berserk we're talking about. But Hunter x Hunter is not what I would consider something that anyone under the age of 12 should be watching. Whatsoever at all. Simply because in Hunter x Hunter, unlike many animes, both modern and old ones back in the days, when the people die in Hunter x Hunter, they actually show it. Right? Like Game of Thrones style. Now, we're not talking about individuals getting their head pummel in or their eyes gouge out and they're showing it bursting out like Angel Cop or something. But we're just, we, it, Hunter x Hunter actually shows the person dying. Like, show them get stabbed or they get their head chopped off or they get exploded. Jojo style. Basically, Hunter x Hunter is like Jojo. They'll show it if they have to. Because it's meant for teens. It's not meant for kids. Um, that said, moving on from that, both, both of them have their little fight on the boat. And from there on after, um, they stop having the fight with each other. Once someone fell off the ship, a uh, sailor um, that's on the ship to take care of the ship, and they're all on the ship in order to go to the hunter exam or at least they're all initiates to become hunters and to take the hunter exam so this is a preliminary period or should i say this is the admission period they're not even in the exam yet they're in the admission process for taking the exam at the moment and like every admission process process of elimination they look over your scores to see how you perform under certain adverse situations and then they considered if you're a healthy candidate ready and willing to take the hunter exam and then you go and take the exam so on this boat is one of those preliminaries to test and see how they act under intense situations there's a storm going there's a guy that fell over the boat what are you going to do go and see if the guy Kropika saves gone Leario saves Kropika or I believe it's Leori saves gone and Kropika saves Leorio. Something trifecta. Moving on from that, they get off the boat, they pass the admission process, they go towards the main hunter lodge. Um, the guy says, What are you guys looking at? It's not that big old palace right there with the big doors and everything. It's this little cooking shack right over here or cooking house. They said, What? This beat up place? said uh yeah this be the place this is the entrance and because if everyone knows where the actually exam took place and every joker would co show up to the exam expecting to get admitted or enemies would find out where the exam is taking place and they would want to sabotage it so it's a good thing to have a place that's run down within a big bustling area so not to stand out so that said they enter into an elevator, they go down the elevator, which goes down to the 100th floor, I believe. And in this room, after passing their mission, they have now entered a room of where many applicants are going to take the first hunter exam. Moving on from that, you see the first of these many people who are going to take the hunter exam. And he's the first person to actually kill someone. And like I said, not for kids. This guy straight up murders someone. That's all there is to it. I believe in the in the more recent anime, they made his um, the way he killed uh, the guy is his hands. The guy's hands turn into flower petals or into uh, card colors or something like that. But in the old fashioned anime, and I believe even in the manga, um, it just shows that his hands dis disappeared and he bleeded out or something. 
Basically, he didn't straight up kill the guy, like stab him to death or explode him or everything. The guy basically bled out because his arm was gone and he died from his arm being gone. I believe in the 1990s anime version, he was stuck inside of a wall or something. So um, he died from being stuck in a wall. You know, half of his body stuck in a wall, the other half very much alive, like being stuck in concrete. So he died regardless. This guy straight up was the first person to kill someone within Hunter x Hunter. And this was the very second episode, if I'm not mistaken, within Hunter x Hunter. The very second episode of the very first season of Hunter x Hunter. So that should give you some idea of what Hunter x Hunter is. Unlike Naruto or unlike One Piece or even Dragon Ball Z, people don't start dropping off like flies until past the fifth episode i believe fifth or sixth episode uh, but in hunter x hunter people start dropping off past the second episode or during the second episode is when someone first died in fact if 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 memory serves me correct i believe someone actually died in the first episode as well in hunter x hunter while they're on the ship i believe someone got killed while they're on that ship in hunter x hunter as well maybe it was in the manga but the point is even in the first episode, I believe someone got killed in Hunter x Hunter. I'm not sure. But first, second, doesn't matter. It's the early portions of the first season. And I'm talking early, early portions of the first season. Not even at the 25% marker. Not even at the 15% marker. Not even at the 10% marker. Not even at the 5% marker someone got KO'd in Hunter x Hunter. So Hunter x Hunter is not made for kids, but yes, kids could watch it because they watered it down for the more recent 2017 version. Um, but still, it's not meant for kids at all. It's it's a mature um, anime, and it has some sexual themes in it as well, or sexual suggestive themes in it as well. Like many animes not meant for kids. Um, so yes, kids shouldn't watch this whatsoever at all. If you make kids watch it, you should... Be careful of what exact episodes they're going to watch. You know, it's like Helsing. You don't make kids watch Helsing. You can make them watch the music of Helsing or how people are talking in Helsing. But when the vampire stuff starts, you don't make them watch it. And the next scene goes on to um, another character within Hunter Hunter called Tompa. He tries to sabish, uh, sabotage everyone. And he tries to, uh, he doesn't want to kill everyone, but he wants everyone to fail. He's Mr. Guy in the blue shirt wearing the 16 um, uh, button on his chest. Yeah, he's a real scumbag. And that's another developing part of the story within Hunter x Hunter. The next character we meet is a guy named Hanzo. Uh, he's a very central character throughout Hunter x Hunter in the manga as well as the anime. Now, one thing I would point out with regards to Hunter x Hunter, and this is not about my opinion about the anime. Every character that I'm saying within Hunter x Hunter, just like every character I would, I would ever say within every anime with the top five list, is a character that's essential in what, what I like to call the long, long run. Or no, the long run, and then the long, long run. Now, when I get to certain characters, I would say long, long run, or I would say short run, or I would say long run. And that basically means that the writer and the creators of the manga, when they were writing Hunter x Hunter, or when they were writing One Piece, or when they were writing Dragon Ball Z, or when they were writing Naruto, or when they were writing Gintama, or any anime for that matter, they were considering characters based on short run, middle run, long run, and then long, long run. And long, long run means end game, means we're not interested in this manga anymore, last publication, that type of long, long run. The journey of characters who were there from the start to characters who were there at last publication. So moving on from that, Hanzo here is what you would call the long, long run. When I first saw him, I thought he was going to be a guy that's going to get killed in the first season or second season of Hunter x Hunter. I knew his skills would transition 
him from the first season of Hunter x Hunter. But I always thought that Hisoka would eventually get him in the second season of Hunter x Hunter, or if not the third. Um, and the first, second, and I believe even the third season were during the Hunter exams. I actually thought he was going to die. But it turns out he's very important and very pivotal, pivotal for future uh, stories within Hunter x Hunter. He's not just an average guy. Um, it's possibly that this guy was based off something that one of the writers or the creator of the manga found to be very interesting and wanted to keep this guy alive for reasons I don't know, but he's very essential towards future stories. Moving on from that, or should I say going back, if I go all the way back from the very beginning, the long, long run is our main guy of the story, the main protagonist. So that's one long, long run. The long run, Mito, she goes away, she comes back, she goes away, she comes back, she goes away, and she stays away permanently, but then all of a sudden she comes back. She's not what it would be called a long, long run. She's just the long run. Kropika, also the long, long run. He's someone that's permanent there. He's not a go away and come back guy or girl. He's a, a permanent part of Hunter x Hunter. It's probably the most important character in all of Hunter x Hunter because his character is attached to a story that's attached to someone else's story. Um, that's an essential part of the manga. And he's more important in some ways than the protagonist of the story. So in w when you think about Hunter x Hunter, you think Gon and you think Killua. But the main character of Hunter x Hunter will probably be the most important and most pivotal character in all of Hunter x Hunter and has been for quite some time, even though he's not the main protagonist, have always been Kropika. Um, why that is, is that's because of his character, his intelligence, his, his, I guess you could say his selfishness, but at the same time, self-assurance. And is I guess he's one of those characters that fighting against himself all the time. He's both conceited, but he's both grateful at the same time. He's both um, boisterous in his behavior of how he do things, not verbally, but how he does things when he does them. But at the same time, he's humble. So he's he crosses two lines. The line between going too far and the line between not going far enough. So you could always play around with, with Kropika to see where you could stretch him, where you could throw him, where you could catch him, where you could reel him back in. He's one of those characters that you could use and, and to create any type of story around because most of his ideas and his strategies are based on his mind alone. It's not completely based on his fist. And simply because he have a unique type of skill that's attached to him, he could use his mind to make that unique physical skill becomes more physically powerful. It's like if Goku was very intelligent, he would make his ability ability to use Kaioken even more stronger than the Goku we, who we know for years that used Kaioken, if Goku was that intelligent, which he's not. So moving on from there, We'll go on to the next character. His name is Killua, and I'm going a little slow, but I'm setting up these characters. He's the long, long, another long, long game. Leero is also a long, long game. Forgot to mention that. And Killua is also long, long game. You won't see his story come to a conclusion until Gon's story comes to a conclusion. They're kind of, they're kind of attached to the hip. One is kind of light, one is kind of dark, or they're both light, or they're both dark. I can't, to this day, I can't tell if 
they're both I think w in all honesty I think both Killua and Gon are both light and dark neither of them are one or the other I think they're both light and dark and you'll understand what I'm saying when I get further into the story moving on into the Hunter Hunter story and less on characters now we meet another guy uh, that's part of the in charge of the hunter hunter or hunter hunter association he's the first examiner i don't remember his name i wish i did but i don't remember his name so i call him mustache guy um or mustachio that's what i'm gonna call him the mustache guy i don't remember his name um is the first examiner his job is to make sure people run and get to the end of the exam or to follow him that was his word follow me to the second exam the first exam was an endurance exam, and the first exam is to test your willpower in order to pursue from one endpoint to get to another endpoint without fail. And without fail meaning to keep up with him to get to that endpoint. However, to get from one endpoint to the next, it's not identified within the challenge of the first exam. So. He literally walked for miles on end. And when I meant walk, his idea of walk is actually run. So when he's walking, he's actually walking at the speed of someone who's running. So when he picks up the pace walking, which is he's actually running, but he's, his legs are so long, he's walking while everyone is running. When he's picking up the pace and he's actually walking fast, it means he's actually running very fast. Um, but it doesn't look like he's running very fast because he's so tall and he's, he has an awkward way of walking that he could take at least four steps forward and it will come across as long strides to anyone else but to him it was just a full step forward so one by one applicants fall victim to the stress of running to try to keep up with a guy that's walking seems like he's running so he falls short I forgot his name as well he falls short number 187 um, Kropik and Leero start to sweat balls and they start to say oh this is crazy this guy's been literally running for miles on end now or they've been running for miles on end he's been walking for miles on end and there seem to be no end towards the tunnel that they're running through and they've been running for probably hours now um, not a full day but for hours and they're still running and so this is basically like a marathon a marathon basically not a mini marathon a full-blown marathon uh, they had no idea that they were going to be running a marathon but they did and the marathon lasted for about hours uh, so much so that the time frame for which they entered into the building in order to get down from the 100th floor to the basement and to proceed on to the first exam, um, by the time they got outside on the other side um, to go to the second exam, it was already, I believe, late afternoon. No, no, it was early afternoon, but it was early afternoon periods or the late morning periods. So who knows what time in the morning they got to that area but it doesn't really matter hours pass anyway hours not hour not one or two like three or four hours pass during this run period for this marathon and at the end going kilowa crossed the finish line both at the same time they challenge each other each other said that they're going to pay each other um in meals he's going to buy this one meals that one's going to buy that one meal and that's that for the first exam. The last guy to try to go under to come out at the other side failed. The gates close on him. He said, wait up for me. They close on him. He failed. He has to come back another year. And that's how the hunter exam goes. It doesn't take pity on anyone. If you cannot keep up with the examiner, you fail. This was simply an endurance as well as a willpower test. Because in a real combat situation, and I said this before at the very beginning, each enemy can represent something, certain things in reality as well as um, how you can use those things in reality within the enemy. I, I guess it, take things from reality and apply it into the anime and then show it in anime form 
on a different type of education level level to the people who are watching it. So in this exercise, it's simply about endurance and how to manage your endurance when you're running and how to pace yourself when you're running and how not to give up and use willpower when you're running. So this is simply an aspect of a different type of training. I guess you could call this physical fitness training, but not really. This is more of endurance training. Um, this is the part of the hunter exam that's more physical than any other part of the hunter exam. The later part of the exams are going to be more mental. So this is over and everyone comes out on the other side. And I really thought that Mr. 107 um, that's shown here was going to be one of the main characters within Hunter Hunter. Turns out I was completely wrong. He's just an average Joe. But um, I thought he was a G at the moment. And in fact, I thought he was going to be a big player in the Hunter Hunter anime, but he was just a random dude. Why I thought this was because when I was younger, he was wearing a full on winter gear and he got to the end of the line from a marathon wearing winter gear. I mean, who runs an entire marathon with a freaking beanie and fully zipped up clothes? while everyone is wearing loose fitting clothes, short sleeve shirt, no shirt on, or just regular clothes on. This dude has a beanie on and he got to the end wearing a beanie. So he's, I, it's assumed that this guy is a boxer type. So endurance is something that he's used to. However, in Hunter Hunter, that isn't enough. So moving on from that, you have to be intelligent, you have to be smart, you have to be crafty, you have to understand how to, your terrain works so another part of hunter 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 that's very intelligent is the use of using your assessment to your surroundings using your brain um, a victim of the circumstances is someone tells you to do something and it turns out that person is not who you think that person is that person is a monster disguising themselves as a human being how would you be able to tell the difference between a human and a monster if the monster looks like a human being. And that's what happens here. The character known as Hisoka tested this situation and said, okay, the only way to tell who's a monster and who's a human being, the monster's at the end, other end of this huge marathon when we're all tired and worn out. Best prey are the weakest prey. Well, he just took his um, cards, which are literally not really cards, but they really are. And they have this weird power about them. And they're like knives. And they kill the guy. The guy falls to the ground. Uh, the enemy falls to the ground next to the guy. Uh, this thing that looked like a monkey. Turns out the monkey is not a monkey. It's a type of monster. And the guy that's um, with the monkey. is Was either manipulated by the monkey. Using some type of hypnotic power. Or took the form of a human being. But regardless. He got killed. The monkey got killed. Hisoka killed him. Um, Hisoka threw cards towards the examiner to see if the examiner was actually the guy because the guy tried to disguise himself as um, the examiner. Uh, only way to test that the examiner was real. Store the cards at the examiner, see if the examiner was catch it. Throw the cards at the guy, see if the guy would catch it. The guy didn't. The examiner did. The examiner survived. The guy's dead. The vultures feed on his body. The anime once again tells you that this is not for kids. Shows that vulture fitting on the dead man's body. Moving on even further to show that this anime wasn't made for kids. A mushroom starts growing out of people's heads and bodies. Not a pretty sight. Moving on from there. It shows once again not made for kids. People falling to their deaths off cliff. Of course the anime didn't show them falling to their death off the cliff. But it did show bodies. Bloody bodies on spikes. Off cliffs. Um, I believe the manga um, showed them running off the cliff and falling to their deaths on the spikes off the cliff. And the old 1991 probably did worse than that. I don't know. Um, the point is, uh, yeah, lots of death in Hunt the Hunter. From the first, from the second episode, moving forward, people start dropping off fights, literally dying. Um, going in Kilauea themselves got eaten by a giant frog, I believe. And Kilowa took the poisonous drink that um, Tompa was trying to give to them. The guy that was trying to make everyone failed. Um, the fat guy. Uh, used that 
poisonous stuff that was within the drink and give it to the frog that swallowed them. The frog didn't like the taste of it, tastes like poison, spat them both out. Both of them survived. It's also at this point, it should be noted that any kid that ever got swallowed up by a giant creature um, would probably die from the shock itself or fall into catatonic panic or shouldn't even be here to be honest with you because no kid would be that physically fixed to, fast to pass the first hunter exam to begin with. So neither of these kids are normal from the jump. Another part of the story and the foundation of that flat story playing with those contours and those crevices and concaves. Um, yeah, so that's another added point into the character of Gon and add a point into the character of Killua. Slowly but surely, but surely, these characters are being fleshed out. And the great part about Hunter Hunter, it doesn't have to tell you that they are fleshing out. And they don't have to get into some dramatic speech of their who they are, where they come from, and all this to flesh themselves out. The story itself, based on the circumstances that they're in, can flesh them out for them. Another unique thing about Hunter Hunter in comparison to other anime. Sometimes the story itself can flesh the characters out not the characters needed to flesh themselves out. Uh, moving on from that, you see Hisoka in the forest with a group of uh, candidates to pass the, who passed the first hunter exam. Going on to the second, he killed them all. Why? Because they decided they're going to give up. They're going to try again next year, but they were going to try to take him out in the process because they knew of who he was and they knew he um, he's someone that doesn't respect Hunter. Or the hunter exam that he's a cold-blooded killer and they saw how you kill that other guy at the very beginning in the, in the first part of the exam and decided that they were going to jump him and kill him eventually he kills them using his cards and the mystery of how he killed people using playing cards which is lighter than uh than even uh, i guess even a cell phone I mean, you can't really kill someone even a pen is more dangerous than a playing card so it's not explained how cards are stronger than a pen or even a knife however that secret i'll describe that i'll describe that secret later so moving on from there we then see after they pass the second part of the hunter exam or they're going to go and pass the second part of the hunter exam um they're on a plane if they got to the murky woods or the murky forest um or the dangerous forest they are on this airship and on this airship, a guy named uh, Netero is seen here, an old man. They don't know that Netero is the leader of the Hunter Association. They thought he's this crazy old man who wants to play um, catch with the ball, you know, until I believe one of the Hunter, leader Hunter um, of the Hunter Association, uh, one of the examiners of the Hunter Association, basically tells everyone that he is the leader of the Hunter Association, Netero. So, Gon and Killua are challenged to, to catch the ball in order to pass the second exam. In fact, he gave the ultimatum. He said, listen, if you could catch this ball from me, you could pass the second exam, no problem. In fact, he even added something else on top of that. He says, if you could catch this ball from me, you don't even need to take the Hunter exam anymore. I'll pass you automatically. And he was quite serious about this. So they never caught it, obviously, but they were very motivated to do it. And Gon is the type of character that does not give up. Another part of his character development. And another thing to watch out with regards, if you're ever interested in reading Hunter Hunter or watching Hunter Hunter, um, one of the reasons why this is my number one anime, the character Gon is someone who's very single-minded to a fault. Typically single-minded to a fault, characters aren't that interested. I mean, aren't that interesting um, because you can't work with them a lot because they're single-minded. But that's the intention of the people who created the character Gone. They wanted his behavior when it comes to doing something and to trying to achieve something to be single-minded. But inside, they wanted the complications to be hidden underneath the thing that are single-minded so that when he pulls on one of those things in order to achieve a goal under his single-mindedness he gets to get one of those things fleshed out on top of his single-mindedness 
Thus, no, it doesn't make him a normal single-minded person. It makes him a more complex single-minded person. It makes him feel like he's more than what he is. And that's something I've always liked about the character Gon as well. It's not that he's always one way, but you can pull on the threads of different characteristics in order to bring a life to his character that would have been dull and dreary when the focus is on him himself. Moving on from that, you get to see a character who has more complexities than Gon himself, and that's Killua, uh, the character we met before. And this is fleshed out even more of how he's more complex than Gon in some ways. His hands harden up, his fingers turn into sharp daggers or sharp claws, um, like a beast claw, but sharper than a beast claw. In fact, his fingers are sharper than knives themselves, sharper than, sharper than daggers. His hand has literally, has literally turned into concrete, or I believe, as he called them, harder than steel. Uh, to the point that his veins are popping out because the energy that requires his fingers, his muscles, his bones, and everything, even his flesh in his body to tighten up to that degree has put a vast amount of strain on his hand to turn it, his hand into a weapon that could pierce through any body or any armor or any metal whatsoever. And his story will be fleshed out even more through Hunter Hunter. Moving on from that, they go on to the third part of the exam, and the third part of the exam happens to be um, within a building. The second part of the exam that was um, I didn't state and I didn't show was a cooking exam. And I breezed past the cooking exam, which is the second exam in Hunter Hunter, because if I stayed on on this for too long, um, the whole my whole five anime for August slash September would go on forever because one piece is very long. Um, so I'll cut that short. So uh, the next scene goes into this guy doing a rock climbing, doing the third exam, or in the process of doing the third exam, and he gets eaten by one of these creatures. So long, farewell. The next scene shows the four characters are four main characters, and to be honest with you, I think all four of these characters are the protagonists of the story of Hunter x Hunter. Yes, Gon is the first person we see, but I have this strange feeling that uh, even though everyone believes Gon to be the primary protagonist of the story, that the primary protagonist of the story is all four of these guys, or at least the primary protagonist of the story is two of these guys, if I'm completely wrong. Um, and that those two people are either Goron or Kropika, or Kropika and Gon. That's what I'm thinking. Um, it always goes back and forth towards going in Kropika, to be honest with you. Oh, but I believe I might actually be fully wrong about this. The, the main protagonist of the story might actually be just going. But how this anime feels, how this anime push forward, makes it to a certain level that each of these characters get their time in the spotlight. To the point that you feel that like they're the main character in Hunter x Hunter. Leorio, not so much. That's why I'm, I'm, when I say four characters are main protagonists, I, I believe that's not, that can't be the true. That, that can't be true because Leorio, Leorio is not focused on a lot within the manga or in the anime. So I know that cannot be the case, but it feels that way. So they're in the cell. And in the cell is, uh, I believe this next part of the third phase, or the, the third exam is called process of elimination or process of doubt or something like that, um, or, or position rules or something something to that matter. And after they figure out that um, process of elimination means, you know, eliminate the weaker person within your party or something like that, they refuse to do that. So they pass the exam because they were able to get to the next section of the exam without losing any of their members on their team. So this last section, I believe, this is, or this is second to last section, they come onto this little walkway, and that's a single walkway that leads to this platform, like an arena stage, where they have to do a one-on-one -on -one duel with someone. And it could either be to the death, or it could be to KO, 
or they could fall to their doom. Depends on how you want to fight, I guess. Because in Hunter Hunter, it's not about you beating your opponent. It's about you surviving. Hunter Hunter is a is an anime about surviving. You could survive by knocking your opponent out. You could survive by outwitting your opponent. You could survive by killing your opponent. But at the end of the day, it's about surviving based on the circumstance that you're in as a hunter. Hunter or hunting. It's, it's called Hunter Hunter for a reason, obviously. Um, because you are a hunter and you're doing the job of hunting. And the job of a hunter is to survive based on what he's hunting or to survive based on uh, what's around him or to survive if what he's hunting starts to hunt him or her or them. Depends. But the job of a hunter is to survive and acquire what they're supposed to acquire successfully after the hunt. They're not much of a hunter if you cannot do the hunt. So moving off from that, we go to Kropika. Kropika's opponent gets beaten to a pulp. Uh, or should I say, Kropika's opponent gets grabbed to the face and then get KO'd in one punch. And under one punch man rules, get knocked out with one punch. Um, he lied on the floor, dead. And we move on to the next section of the exam. Uh, they escape the tower. Or should I point out the fact of why he got knocked out with one punch. He got knocked out with one punch because he wanted to pretend to be someone for which Kropika hates. And as someone is, or should I say those some ones, are called the spiders. And the spiders are very much like the Akatsuki and Naruto. They are a murderous group of people that take the lives of others for their own ambitions. Apparently the, the spiders kill Kropika's whole family and as well as his entire clan. And so Kropika has been on the revenge path ever since his entire clan was wiped out and their eyes were taken from them. So a little bit worse than the Akatsuki, uh, or should I say a little bit worse than what Akatsuki has done because, you know, Akatsuki just killed people that are in their way or killed for their own reasons. The spiders basically kill people in their way for their own purposes and take from those people useful parts of their bodies to sell on a bidding auction. So that is kind of messed up in its own way. A little bit worse than Akatsuki, but I don't know. Uh, I'm still iffy iffy on whether Akatsuki are worse than the spiders or spiders are worse than Akatsuki when it comes to their actions that they take. So moving on from that, you get to the next section and we meet this woman. She's an announcer. She speaks to them about the fourth part of the exam. Um, and the fourth part of the exam is uh, basically uh, go into the woods and survive within the woods for as long as possible until the ship comes back, picks them up, and whoever survives and has the, I, I, the chest tag or the badge, the badge number of their allotted opponent or their identified or told opponent, um, as well as keeping their own, they succeed and they've passed the fourth exam, fourth part of the exam. So they know the type of, uh, their, the badge that they picked up, or should I say, the badge that they're, they're given or I believe it's something like picking out from inside of a box. Uh, they picked it up, and the badge that each of them pick up is the, the badge or the identifying tag of the opponent that they're going to be facing. So moving on from that, um, Lohan picks up uh, Hisoka's tag, which is um, number 44, which is bad luck for him. Um, other members within the the party uh, pick up badges of other people and the straight hunting starts to happen within the fourth part of the exam so it's essential to point out that um yes hunting in hunter hunter does happen people hunting people people using different tactics people using signs 
people I'm not sure if anyone's going to be using math or English but various different forms of how to hunt people um, yeah uh, that's something to be considered so this guy takes this guy out with poison tip arrows falls to the floor takes his badge moving on from that going goes to a nice little pond he doesn't go for fishing, but he goes to see how a bird decides to pick a fly. Um, no, a bird goes to swoop down and grab a fish from the pond based on the fish itself jumping up to grab the fly and eat the fly. Um, another part of nature that happens, a real thing in nature that happens that they use in the anime. So going realizing this tactic, decide to use this tactic grab Hisoka's um, uh, chest tag and while Hisoka is killing someone takes it from Hisoka runs away eventually gets a dart in the neck by um, a Gareta or uh, Gareta or Gareta or I forgot how to pronounce his name um, who's also a blow dart hunter falls to the ground eventually um, Gareta dies himself Collapse to the ground. Hisoka kills him. Um, Hisoka drops uh, Gon's badge back at him and says, Thank you uh, for making things entertaining. How you were able to get it from me is remarkable, supreme work. Um, Gon say he doesn't want the badge back, but Hisoka says, I don't care what you want. I'm giving this to you and I'll use you when I need to use you for my own purposes because you were able to achieve something at your age that uh, no one has ever achieved against me so go and realize he didn't actually got his Hisoka's badge um, because he actually got his Hisoka's badge um, by himself he realized he got Hisoka's badge um, out of pity not the way he got the badge that he got by himself but the way he, that he couldn't keep the badge by himself the whole point of the exam is not only to get your opponent's badge, is to keep the opponent's badge without them taking it back and to keep your own badge. So he wasn't able to attain Hisoka's badge because of himself uh, and keep said badge. He was able to attain such badge and keep it because Hisoka made him keep it. So moving on from that, we get to the final part of the Hunter exam called the fifth part of the exam. And the fifth part of the exam is a hand-to-hand -hand combat part of the exam. So during this hand-to-hand -hand combat exam, Gon fights Hanzo. Hanzo fights Gon. Hanzo breaks Gon's arm. Um, Gon says he's not going to give up. He gets his arm broken. And in the process of, of that happening, during uh, the fifth part of the hunter exam, Gon is completely um, knocked out and had to go to a uh, medical room and then bed rest for quite some time. Gon wakes up to find out that uh, Killua kills his opponent within the fifth part of the exam. Killua asks, um, Gon asks why Killua killed his own opponent during the exam. And uh, he says, because um, the opponent that uh, another opponent instigated him to in order to, to get out of the exam by killing his opponent. And this other person that uh, made him do this or manipulate his mind to do so was his own brother who was disguising as another hunter within the exam um, so that's how Kilo got kicked out of the hunter exam because even though killing is allowed within the hunter exam during the fifth part of the hunter exam killing was not allowed during the fifth part of the hunter exam and that was a big no no so that was an illegal move that Kilowa did. He got kicked out. And this is the face of the guy that um, got him kicked out. He doesn't look like much, but he's extremely powerful. He kind of looks like a weirdo. He has a lot of pins stuck in him. His eye has weird eyes, weird hair, and weird ears, and weird eyebrows. But um, he's a completely psychotic person. And he's part of a family called the Zodic family, the, the family that Kilo was part of. And Kilo's father has same silver hair like he does, and is a famous um, assassin, has been a famous assassin for years. And 
his basically the crest of Killua's family is legendary. It's been passed down from generation to generation to generation. They're basically uh, a house of assassins. You know, rather than a house of kings and a house of queens and princes and stuff, they're a house of assassins. And um, the mantle of ownership towards the next heir to the throne of being the leader of the entire house is going to go to Kilowa. And in order for that to happen, he has to throw away all attachments towards individuals such as friendship and all this other stuff. Um, his brother was sent to spy on him to make sure he keeps to that path. Unfortunately for his brother, he found out that Kilowa started to behave erratic and not in the way that he was raised to be simply because of his association with Gon. And Gon was the person that started to show Killua that there is a way beyond that, the way of assassination and killing, and that you could be your own man and make your own craft, your own future for you. You don't have to follow in the ways of his family. As long as you have the will, you could achieve everything you want. As long as you know how to achieve it and what way you can achieve it. Of course, Gon, He's not that smart enough to tell him how to because Gon is still a kid and he's just gone. But Killua sees in Gon a certain way of achieving certain things that he never thought of before. This is not good with um, uh, Killua's brother on the other hand. And Killua's brother name, this guy's name is Illumi. So moving on from that, Gon discovers that uh, Killua has been kicked out because he killed a guy. Gon goes up to Illumi and says, Illumi, where is Killua? Illumi says, you don't want to go to where Killua lives. My family's home. Um, Gon insists. Gon breaks his arm. Next scene we see is um, the house of Illumi's family. We see a heavy set guy. We see a woman with a laser eye. And we see a kid. And in this house, which is the Zoldic house, um, these people are each individual that are in this house are a different type of assassins. The heavy set kid used mostly his brains and his tech in order to assassinate people. The mom used with um, her own personal way of assassination as well as the kid using her own personal powers in order to assassinate people. Basically, every person in the house of the Zolik family is an assassin. Even the damn butler is, is an assassin. So when they go to find Killua in order to get him to join them again, be part of the crew and to rescue him from his messed up family that got him kicked out of the hunter association to begin with they had to go through another form of a trial or a contest or uh, a level of accelerating to make themselves stronger and they had to push through a huge door that probably we are like five tons or something three three four or five tons by pushing through this door that was one of the hurdles to even to get into the house of the Zolik family. After they successfully did that, which caused them about a good two days or so um, to get strong enough, probably more than two days, probably three days, for them to get strong enough. It, it might have actually been more than three days, but they, they've been trying for, to, to push anything that's more than a ton. It means you have to be like a hard horse nigga type hell to push anything that's under a ton. Um, you have to be an Arnold Schwarzenegger type. Hell, to push anything past 500 pounds, you have to be like an Arnold Schwarzenegger type. So each of these doors weighs anywhere from two to three or, or five tons. Like the first couple of doors are like two tons. Next couple of doors, so on, grows in numbers and numbers grow. The closer you get to the house. So there are three doors in total. So you can guess how many tons they had to push just to get inside the front door. Uh, I believe in total, uh, it probably was like 12 tons before they even get inside. But they, uh, thankfully, they never have to go, go to the very first door in order to open it. Um, because one of the helpers of the family um, was, was able to help them to get past the second and the last door to get inside of the house. So all they had to do was go through the painstaking first door in order to get through. Well, doing so, they met a character here, another part of the butler team. She decides to stop them. They decide to get past her. She decided that she doesn't understand why they want to get to Kilowa. 
they said they basically told her that uh, uh, they're friends of his um, the leader of the family comes in to see Kilowa being tortured by his brother um, the leader tells him you know stop stop torturing uh, Kilowa um, I need to have a conversation with him um, I believe his name is Zeno no No, his name is not Zeno. I forgot what his name was. Um, not important. Moving on from that, Kilowa is then uncuffed. He goes to meet his father. His father's name is Silva. Um, that I remember clearly. Um, and Silva is the head of the family household, sitting on his, his chair, which is like a bed. Um, Ask Kilowa what he sees in Gun, why he wants to become a hunter standard stuff he says at first he thought it was fun but now he realized that uh, Gun makes him feel like he's more than just who he is doing so he allows Kilowatt to leave Kilowa leaves and goes with Gun they head off to the next part of the adventure within Hunter Hunter so the exams are over Gun is fully fledged hunter at this this moment he has his hunter badge he's not classified as a hunter Hanzo is a hunter, Leora is a hunter, Kropiko is a hunter, everyone is a hunter except Killua, but it does not matter. As long as Killua is with Gon, their best friends, things are fine. They go to this place called Heaven's Arena, and in Heaven's Arena they become stronger, and eventually they go to sign up and meet this, uh, this various people that are in the line. One of the guys look like Bruce Lee with his outfit. They move on past the arena, they get to each fighting areas within the arena. Eventually, they meet this kid, and um, this kid is an essential, not a long-term player, more like a sh short-term player throughout Hunter x Hunter. He'll pop up every now and again, but he's simply part of the Heaven's Arena arc, if I remember that clearly. His name was Zushi, and he's part of the Heaven's Arena's arc. Um, later on, he might show up in future uh, Hunter x Hunter stuff, but I haven't seen him since, so... He's part of the shorter long term. He's not part of the long long term or the long term. He's part of the mid or short term. He's only part of the arc. So Zushi is an essential part of this arc as well as his master. I forgot his master name. Um, I don't remember his master name. I remember the, the kid's name is Zushi. And he teaches Killua and Gon the art of Nen and that comes later and it only comes later after Killua has a fight with Zushi in the arena when Killua could have easily killed Zushi using his assassination technique but he didn't he decided to go for a knockout unfortunately for Killua he couldn't knock him out because Zushi was using um, Nen and then allows him to use his internal energy, his life force energy, in order to um, use 10. And 10, I believe 10 is what it is called hardening your body. Uh, it's either 10 or Ren to harden one's body or one's constitution. Um, and so he was able to get up no matter how many times Killer knocked him down. Moving on from that, um, we get to see Hisuko showed up to the party within Heaven's Arena. They don't know why he's there. He's just there. He says he was following them. They see that's creepy. That's he's like a stalker, but he's there for personal reasons. For reasons why, it's only assumed that he's there because um, Gon broke Ilumi's arm, and the fact that Gon was able to survive the second exam with. In the hunter examination see past the first exam his didn't pay attention to gun whatsoever but the fact that he was able to survive the murky mar marshes or um, wet marshes survive against the monsters there survive against the dangerous other fighters there as well as to survive against him himself during the second exam um, those things fascinated him the second exam and the fact that he was able to um, pass the last exam and broke Lumi's arm 
those things are the reason why he's here. The fact that a child could pass the hunter exam and be here. Now, Hizuka doesn't really know about Gon's father, and I, I think in Hunter Hunter, it's assumed that he does know about Hunter's um, Gon's father when he was a kid, but it's not stated so. So I don't know if he's actually after Gon because he's actually after Gon's father, the power that Gon has inherited from his father. Or he's actually after Gon's father and he's using Gon to go after Gon's father. Or just the power that Gon's father wield has passed on to Gon himself. That's what I'm getting when I watch Hunter x Hunter. That it's that power that's hidden within Gon passed on to him from his father. Or something completely different and I don't know. So moving on from that, it's stated within the anime, Nen is... The useless one's mind force. It's the nature, uh, or should I say, it's the use of one's mind force to manipulate nature, nature energy around you in order to make your body become immune to certain things that will eventually hurt you in the long term. And he then says, well, what, by using that nature and by using then, um, which is nature energy or mind force, using your mind to manipulate nature energy, um, you could then cast um, that nature energy and make it into like using your mind force along with nature energy, like a shroud over your body uh, or aura. Make your aura of, of nature, the wind around you, and heat from your body and everything else as part of your existence as well as your mind to manipulate everything around you to become like a shroud of thick energy around you like a, a second or third layer of skin but it's invisible and that's 10 uh, that's what uh, basically um, what I believe is what was used during Zushi's battle against Kilowa in order for him to keep standing up and then Zetsu is another form of martial arts um, that's within Hunter x Hunter that's called suppressing one's presence and suppressing one's um, natural powers or mind powers from your enemy as well as from your uh, from anyone else who's trying to defeat you or trying to kill you. Um, it's a way of hiding your presence completely. Now, it cannot hide you yourself like say if you're standing out in the open field you're obviously being seen standing out in the open field but if you're hiding somewhere in the open field and the enemy can't literally see you with their eyes but they could sense you based on the use of Nen then it doesn't matter if you hide because they'll be able to sense you what Zetsu does is Zetsu hide that energy force that all human beings or all animals have from being identified so you're basically hiding both your uh, your physical presence by using your body to hide yourself as well as hiding your energy of who you are from your enemy and that's what that is and he described these are as five teachings or something like that and then he teaches it to the he teaches it to Gon and he teaches it to Kaloa but eventually he starts to see something, something that's very strange. And the strange thing happened to be um, growing inside of Gon. He doesn't know what it is, but it's a type of energy that he feels that's um, unnerving. He cannot describe it. It doesn't have a form or anything. It's just this feeling, an unnerved feeling that he gets when he, when Gon is tr showing his behavior when he's fighting in an arena or when he's using his powers in a combat situation not when he's meditating only when he's in a combat situation and he's concentrating and it's because of this he starts to assume that Gon might actually secretly have a type of devil inside of him or a type of monster that's resting inside of him that he doesn't know about or and he doesn't understand or it's possible maybe he is describing that this 
behavior, or this feeling, is Gon's inability to see a solution to another problem without using his way of solution to a problem. Like I said before, Gon is very one-sided or one-track minded and his way of solving every problem is only using one method in order to solve a problem. What I meant by this is he could use a fishing hook, he could use playing cards, he could use the environment around him, he could use anything to be his opponent, but single-minded in how he does it is I am going to beat you and you can't make me not beat you and you can't tell me that I can't beat you because I'm never going to give up until I beat you even though he knows even though in reality he might not be able to beat his opponent he will never stop until he beats you even though he really can't beat his opponent he just won't stop it's like there's this hunger within Gon in order to keep making himself stronger or this hunger in order that's being fed into his belief that he can accomplish everything that he wants to accomplish even though he probably can't there's this thing that's being fed within Gon um, either from his ego or from the use of using Nen to boost his ego to manifest this type of behavior within him. And when uh, Zushi's teacher tells him tells himself this, he, while he's meditating, he's like, I might have created a monster uh, and regrets um, teaching Nen to go on. It kind of is too late because the moment Nen was told to go on and the moment Go and learned of how to use none abilities. It was already too late, because he's not that type of person that stops doing something when he starts doing something. It just basically keeps evolving further and further and further. So moving on from that, Izuka then meets someone who's a girl who's part of the spiders, and she's one of the dangerous one of the spider group. I'm not sure how dangerous she is, to be honest with you, um, but she's part of the spiders. Um, moving on from that, and, and Hisuka does not tell Kropika that uh, he's working with the spiders either. It's only assumed that uh, Hisuka is working by himself. Through the others, they all assume that he's working by himself. He's a man working by himself, but he's not. He's working with the spiders. He's not part of the spiders. He's working with the spiders. He's pretending to be one of them, but he's not really one of them. So doing so, after healing his injuries from his competition within Heaven's Arena, he heals himself up using his own powers, which is um, um, is a type of gum. Um, I forgot his name. Uh, the name of the gum that he used is called... Uh, something elastic and it's used in order to move everything move his weapons harden his weapons heal his body uh, make him get from place to place fast and as well as um, evade as well as repel certain actions and move from other opponents moving on from that we get to see a bunch of uh, clownies here and these clownies are three different opponents which Gon and Kilo has to fight before they actually become floor masters. Um, neither Gon or Kilo is actually interested in being floor masters, but these guys are geniuses and think they, they really want to be. Um, eventually, Kilo shows up to his place and says, Listen, man, we don't give a damn about being floor masters, but we don't want you to harm Zushi. And I want you guys to either play fair your other little cronies to play fair or you quit because if you don't I kill you so the best thing Kilowatt tells him to do is don't show up to your next match quit get out of heaven's arena never do this type of work again because if I see you in heaven's arena again I'm gonna kill you so 
Moving on from that, the guy quit, never showed up to this match. The next match that did happen is between, or should I say the final match that happened, is already now that happens, after many matches happens, is going in uh, Hisoka's match. So, it's at this point that within the anime, uh, certain type of sexual themes are presented within the character of Hisoka. It's assumed that Hisoka has a thing for boys, or young boys, which I'm not cool with whatsoever at all. But it could just be a fetish of his, and he, he's probably not a pedophile. But it's, I guess the anime is trying to uh, make it to a point of saying that Izuka has, is, is kind of a pedophile, but he's not really a pedophile. He just have a thing for, for strong people, and Gon and Killua just happen to be strong people that he see in the future. Um, but there are certain scenes he gets turned on by, um, by Gon and Killua, which makes it to, m makes it a very compelling case to say that this guy is probably, you know, a pedophile type. I mean, he already have murder on his roster. He already have espionage and theft and all, all sorts of other you know, nefarious activities on his old roster of criminal offenses throughout the history of his life. Why not add pedophilia as part of it as well? But the anime doesn't go deep into that stuff. You know, he's, he's not actually, you know, doing stuff like that to an extreme. It only hints at the fact that he might just like boys or he might just like some, anyone who has powers. Could be a man, could be a woman doesn't matter and he gets turned on by it he gets turned on by the, the fact that someone is p more powerful than him or could have a certain type of power that he wants maybe he's just a weirdo that way uh, moving on from that going and kill what leaves heaven's arena they end up back with mito and mito's grandmother or should i say gone's grandmother and they sit at the table, they say the grace, they eat their pancakes, they eat their food, they eat the fish, they enjoy their um, dinner slash breakfast. It's very weird. Um, and eventually at the end, Mito gives um, Gon this box left by Gon's father. And Gon's father's name is Jin, or Gin, um, G-I-N-G, -I, I believe. And what this box re represents is it represents Gon's future throughout other arcs that are going to happen later on in Hunter x Hunter. Preferably one called Greed Island. And before he gets to Greed Island, he must uncover the secrets of what's inside of the box himself. But in order to do so, he has to use Nen in order to open the box. So once he does open the box, he found a joystick card and a ring from his father, I believe, and also a tape recording. Um, he played that tape recording, um, and I believe he kept the ring and um, something else. But moving on from that, we get to the next scene within Hunter x Hunter. I believe this is past the, the first season going into the second season, where they're officially hunters, and now they're working with different organizations throughout the different parts of the world. Kaloa is um, working with, alongside his, uh, well, he's not really working with his father, but he's doing the stuff for his family. And uh, Kropika is now working for a syndicate organization because the syndicate organization have information related towards getting um, his eyes from his family. And uh, these crimson eyes are the eyes of his house. And they're known as, um, I, I guess, the uh, the red crimson eyes or um, the red colored crimson eyes or the red eyes depending on how it's described within the manga and and, uh, and the anime so these eyes are very important to um, Kropika in order for him to retrieve aspects of I shouldn't say aspects but to retrieve history or to retrieve memories or I don't know what Kropika really needs them for but it's more like to attain things that belong to his bloodline, to stay with his bloodline. Moving on from there, um, we then move to a part where we see uh, Killua's uh, brother, 
um, Illumi, well, not Illumi, um, uh, I forgot his name. Is. I guess the it's, it's hard to remember every name of every character within the anime, so I'm just going to leave that there. Um, it, the heavyset brother basically says, listen, um, I need you to get this to, uh, information to Killua, Gave, give it to his hawk. And uh, Killua gives him, his brother, this uh, job to do. And the job is to decipher what was on the disc from the Greed Island found within the box that Gon, um, Gon discovered. But actually, was that it? No. Killua said he was going to pay um, Mizuki, that's his name. Mizuki, he was going to pay Mizuki, his brother, um, a substantial amount of money if he's able to find that information with regards to Greed Island. He, Mizuki goes to the Hawk, do the old putting, writing stuff on a piece of paper, wrap it around the Hawk's feet, sending it back to Killua, the old fashioned way of doing messages. Um, that's that. Moving on to the next scene. Um, Killua gets the information from his brother, um, state where the location of the possibly uh, true a copy of Reed Island can be found. Of course, Mizuki couldn't find certain things with regards to it, so he got frustrated. But moving on from there to here, um, we then see the leader of the spiders reading a book uh, because he's really into books and learning things. Um, how to use various spells, how to use his nan ability in order to conjure certain things with regards to various spells because he's he's a conjurer and nan typically falls into five different types. If I didn't say that before, I'll say it now. Nan falls into five different types. Type one, conjurer. Type two, enhancer. Type three, um, uh, what do you got? Uh, or is it four? Yeah, conjurer, enhancer, manipulator, um, what's the other one? Teleporter or something like that. And the last one is specialist. So I believe there's four, four of them in total. And then the fifth one is specialist type. Um, that said, or was it, uh, yeah. Manipulator, Conjurer, Enhancer. The point is, there are five of them. Um, this guy is a Conjurer. Moving on from that, um, get to the next scene. Um, the Spiders' little dumping duo, you know, all of the members of the Spiders invaded, uh, uh, I guess, a Mafia group party. Um, at, I think York New City, that was the name of it. Invaded their little charade, their little party, um, killed off the mafia people, took all their treasure because the spiders are thieves. That's what they do. And in the end, um, Uvo, Uvogin, one of the spiders, that's the name of one of the spiders, this guy here, this hairy guy, is captured by Kropika. And Kropika happens to be a conjurer. He conjure. He could conjure metal, or in this case, he could conjure chains from his hands um, to grab on and chain his opponents down and subdue their nem from them using nem or from them moving whatsoever. So Vogan gets captured, a member of the spiders gets captured and interrogated by Kravika. Um, however, during this interrogation, um, he got free, but then eventually he went back to get revenge, and he got captured again. So Uvogin is not that bright. Um, and he did discover one thing, though, that uh, Kropika is more than just a conjurer. Kropika is a specialist, and a specialist is basically someone um, who's able to use all different NEM types. You either you, you're able to use three to four NEM types or you could use every one of the NEM types. 
um, or I think specialist goes according to if you could use more than two NAND types, you're a specialist. Um, if you use three NAND types in total at a high caliber, you're a specialist. Um, but if you could use all NAND types, you're also a specialist. So I, I believe in order for you not to be a specialist, you could only use a maximum of two NAND types and maybe a portion of a third NAND type. But to fully be a specialist, you would have to use all of the various different NAND types, or at least a total of three. I, be, I believe in order to be a specialist, you have to be able to use all NAND types, every one of them, not just one, two, or three of them, but every one of them. So Karapika is able to use all different NAND types, and not just at a certain percentage, like at 20% or 30% or they're going back and forth up and down which one has more than the other which one has more percentage he's able to use a high percentage of men for each of these different men type groups that are beyond 50 percent so he's enhancing using his enhancer ability to enhance other different men types that he has and in doing so he's able to make himself a strong conjurer as well as a stronger manipulator as well as a stronger uh, enhancer um, so even though he's not an enhancer and even though he's not a manipulator he's able to use more than 50 percent of those different type of non abilities that will be passed on to other people that other people have that's what makes him a specialist so he takes out Uvogen pretty easy um, and the next scene you see here is Gon, Kilowa, and Leia Rio discussing how they need to capture the spiders themselves. So, at this point here, um, Uvogin is pretty much dead. I'm not going to show how he died, but he is dead. Um, he is no match for Kropika. His size doesn't matter. His strength doesn't matter. In the world of Hunter Hunter, what matters most is who has the most amount of power. Power is what makes you strong. Not the size of your body, not how much bench presses you could do, not how fast you could run, not how much, how much you, could, how fast you could solve a puzzle in comparison to another person. It's how much power you have in more than one of these different type of things called men. And if you're able to have more power in more than one or one or two of these things called men, you're able to outwit, outlive or out revive or even you know out strength or how out power an opponent um in the case of Vogan, he relies solely on his enhancer abilities to strengthen himself and his i believe his manipulator abilities as well or, or transmuter abilities in order to make himself invisible while he's being strong at the same time basically to become like a shadow or like the predator and then hit you with a huge punch but you can't see where the punch is coming from so he can really only Logan can really only use like two um, nan abilities but for the transmuter abilities are um, to, in order to suppress or should I, yeah in order to suppress his ability he could only suppress about I would say about 50% um, so even as a, you know, a transmuter, um, in order to suppress his ability, it's not that good. Not compared to Kropika, however. Um, so he's dead. And Gon, Leorio, and Krop and, and Kilowa are trying to look, capture some spiders themselves. Moving on from that, um, the leader of the spiders pretend to be one of uh, um, the bodyguards at uh a gambling casino where a girl is supposed to be i guess a high fidelity client or part a daughter of one of the boss and she has an ability to predict the future so he wants to see her and after he saw her he got information from her with regards to the spiders based on she reading his future um the note basically says what will happen in the future and he realized this note is a 
kind of a death sentence to certain people within his group, within the spiders. But he doesn't know how many are going to die. And he doesn't know who are going to die. He just knows uh, a certain amount of spiders are going to die. So knowing this, he's um, the enemy is basically stating um, the one he's assuming that might die are Uvogin and the girl with the glasses. Um, so from his point of view, he he just did process of elimination to figure out who he believed might that be next, the girl in the glasses. Um, that turns out not to be the case because uh, Mr. Uh, I guess Hisuka, if I remember clearly, manipulated the sheet of paper in order to give a false sense of information to his um, to the spiders. In order, in other words, they're reading something that he's manipulated using his manipulator abilities because Hisuka is a manipulator. His then power is that of uh, manipulation. Um, so he can manipulate what people are reading and what they're doing and what they're seeing and what they're touching. Um, and they would never know uh, that's being manipulated because they don't have that type of power in order to see these things. Uh, only another manipulator can see what another manipulator is doing. Or someone who has strong manipulator powers past 50% can see what a, someone who's a master of manipulation ability is doing. So on and so forth. Moving forward. Um, Goon and Kilo gets captured by the spiders. Eventually, um, they're told to spill the beans or otherwise they'll get killed. Um, but what inevitably, inevitably happened is um, the spider leader gets captured and Kropika managed to cripple um, his powers and remove it from himself from the spider leader's body not like fully remove it from outside his body but remove it like neutralize his abilities to ever use them again um, so when Hisuka goes to fight the boss of this group um, leader of the spiders and his name is Lucifer Krolo Lucifer um, hell of a name for the leader of the spiders Luc to call him Lucifer um, when Lucifer goes to fight Izuka, basically tells him, listen man, I can't fight you because I have no more men. And that's the end of the story of that. Izuka gives up. Crowley Lucifer gives up. The spiders give up. Goon and uh, Kropika and, and Killua and Lorio, Lirio give up. All of them gave up because there's no reason to kill Lucifer or to capture Lucifer if he doesn't have the ability to use his name anymore. He's just like every other normal human being. Yes, he's still a criminal. Yes, he still have a bounty on him. But from the point of view from those who use Nen or those who've mastered Nen, he's not even a threat anymore. He's like any any run of the mill guy walking down the street now. So they don't even mess with him. They don't even try to arrest him or anything. Or keep, him, or keep him on lock and key just in case his power comes back or something. They don't even give a damn. So apparently that's a, a theme in Hunter x Hunter. Like if you lost your Hunter powers and you can't use it anymore, no one even tries to, you know, put you in jail or anything like that. It's, it's very weird. They could have still kept him. Uh, could have still gave him to the authorities, but it's a no screw him. Um, he's not a threat to anyone anymore. He's basically a weakling. And that was the end of Crowley Lucifer and the spiders. I mean, it's technically not, it's technically not over, but uh, it's over for that moment. So moving on to the next part of Hunter x Hunter. Um, and what I'll do is I'll skip past some of these. Um, the Greed Island. Um, Goan fought against the boss of the Greed Island. As we're seeing here, this is the boss of the Greed Island. Greed Island arc was long and should not have been that long and should not have been that painstaking. Um, but Gun in the end fought off, beat the boss of the Green Island. And the only thing to come out of Green Island, I would say, that was very interesting were 
one or two things that were vastly interesting to me. One was a character called Bisky. And Bisky is a woman disguising herself as a girl. And what made Bisky so different from any other character within Hunter x Hunter, she could manipulate her body to be extended to a certain amount that she turns into a giant-sized Hercules type. Muscles and all. Huge body. Huge neck, huge muscles, huge thighs, the whole works. She's basically Arnold Schwarzenegger on crack. And that's who Bisky was. Um, and then she would reverse back into this tiny little teen girl as to disguise herself or to disguise herself from everyone else so they wouldn't know that she was this powerful. Obviously to men users they could tell that she has a certain amount of powers but how much they didn't know. Uh, the second part of the Green Island that I thought, found that was fascinating was the use of um, the cars in order to revive people. Um, Angel's Breath, I believe it was called, how it could simply bring someone back from the dead. And I believe that was going to be a major factor coming into later arcs throughout the uh, throughout the manga, I believe, uh, but it turns out that wasn't the case. Um, but those were two things within the Great Island that fascinated me more than anything was the introduction of Bisky, the character Bisky, and the use of the, the thing called Angel Breath um, within a game to actually bring someone back to life or to heal someone completely. Um, it literally did not make any sense to me that uh, a product, a game product, like an NPC, had the ability to heal a real person. Um, but they were actually inside of the game as well. So they weren't technically 100% um, human in form. It was their nen that allowed them to, I guess, to be somewhat digitized. I don't even know if it was digitized. Because when they were getting hurt and when they were spitting up blood, that, that was all real. Um, but apparently in this world, I guess even the fictitious stuff, the NPC stuff, they could heal real wounds and real damage and real injuries. So those things fascinated me more about in, er, anything else in Greed Island. So once Greed Island came to an end, I moved on to the next arc. So we're going punches again through, and that was the name of the last bad guy within Green, uh, Greed Island. Again through, knocks him out, does his last, you know, big uh, rock, paper, scissors punch, collects the cards, uses Angel's Breath. Everyone tries to go, go after Gun and uh, go in and kill a lot in order to get their cards. Doesn't turn out so well for them. Bisky says goodbye to Gun. Gun says goodbye to Bisky. Um, the story ends with Greed Island. The next one that uh, continues is something called the Chimera Arc um, where he meets the, the guy named Kite that he met when he was a child, Gun met when he was a child on Whale Island. Um, so he finally uh, he's finally able to meet Kite again and through the process of this continue the story of Kite and Gon in relations to each other and with relations to his father again. So moving on from that, uh, Kite tells him, you've grown up, you've matured, so you've been to Great Island and you've passed your exam, great. So there have been many, I think there have been a total of three different arcs in Hunter Hunter so far. There was the exam arc, there was an arc before, uh, no, no, there was an arc after um, Heaven's Arena, and then there was Great Island. It was probably like four arcs. Three main one, and one mini one. And now we're here on the Chimera. But it was a total of three main ones. And now we're here on the Chimera. And Chimera arc is basically the last, I would say, with regards to this video. Um, and then I'll move on to the next one. And the next one is going to be... Um, the next one is going to be on the top five. 
is going to be one piece. So tomorrow I'm going to tomorrow I'm going to put one piece. So out of the top five, so it's the top five is not going to be in this list, otherwise this video is going to take forever. Out of all of the different top fives, um, I'm going to separate them into sections. Tomorrow is going to be One Piece. And it's going to be a different anime. Or it's just going to be One Piece. And no, it's going to be One Piece and it's going to be a different anime. And the day after tomorrow, which is going to be Monday, is going to be the final two animes. So today is purely going to be the first anime on the top five of many animes for um, August to July, um, August to September 2023. And that's Hunter x Hunter. So moving on from that, we'll go to the Chimera arc, Kite. And the next scene here shows the queen sitting on her chair and about to give birth to the king. Um, but in order to do so, she requires sustenance. Sustenance means food. Animals, trees, leaves, human beings, um, you name it, she'll eat it. But the Chimera arc was always strange to me because based on the different characters within the Chimera arc, um, they all look very strange. Obviously, the word Chimera is used, so they're all, all supposed to look strange. But the point of the Chimera arc when it comes to the strangeness is that some of them look bizarrely and when I meant bizarrely ridiculous, some of them look very ridiculous. That they thought of it felt like the writer and director wanted to make the most ridiculous looking characters that you could possibly think of. However, this is not a video about judging things until I get towards the end of all the top five animes of all time so moving on from that um, we see the queen talking to her advisor her advisor talk back to the queen um, he says you need more food he advised um, the minions to get more food uh, her servants um, to the queen to get more food some of them follow the queen some of them don't there are actually certain people who want to go their own way and don't fall in the queen's ways while there are those who are loyal to the queen and will do exactly what she says until the day they die. Um, amongst these people who are trying to um, do their own thing, but at the same time be loyal to the queen, is this guy right here, one of the Chimera Ants. And the Chimera Ants are very weird. I mean, they're basically amalgamations of, of different species, but they're all connected to one. An insect in some shape and form. I guess that's the only way to allow the word ant to be associated with all of them is to have a, a part of their body be insect-like. If a part of their body is not insect-like, they can't really be called chimera ants, can they? Um, and this is the thing about uh, the chimera, uh, the chimera ant uh, saga that always confuse me um some characters didn't look like they were anything related to ants whatsoever or anything even remotely in relations to an ant they just look like chimeras in total like they look like chimeras in total but the word ant does not fix towards their existence um if you were thinking uh, an ant that's a chimera an aspect of that character, no matter what that character is, would have to be somewhat associated with ant. It can't just be that the queen looks like an ant or there are people in the army who are ants and there are certain people who are loyal to the chimeras ants that aren't ant because if that's the truth and that's what's going on within the, very, the armies of the chimera ant, then these individuals, these different chimeras aren't are different type of breeds of chimeras that aren't ant like they're a chimera of a different species than you know anthropods so yes chimeras exist but they're not all ant in existence I guess you could say 
they're all chimera types. I guess you could say that chimera mammals or chimera ants as officially are, and chimera amphibians, as long as the word chimera is used, that they can all be associated with each other uh, or be in allegiance with each other if they're chimeras. That's the main glue that keep them together. So that's that's what I'm getting at here, or what I'm I am assuming that that's what the link between the word chimera and, and them all looking weird means. So that said, moving forward, we see various different chimera ants and various different form chimera ants. Some look like lions, some look like little girls. It's very weird. Some look like rabbits with bodies of men, but hands that of birds and wearing freaking bikini underwear it's it's a bizarrity um chimera to the sense that even their clothes is chimera um and moving on forward from that we then see the character bisky as the chimera ant saga goes on bisky starts to tell going about the chimera ants and others about the chimera ants and how they have to get stronger same as what kate told them um so Bisky wants them to be trained again for by various different people. This guy um, called Knuckle is one of the guys that are going to train Gon and Killua. And he's the real diehard type. And he likes fighting and he likes brawl. And he has a vast amount of power. However, he ha also has a big mod as well. So sometimes Gon and Killua get pissed off at him. Um, but they remember the teaching of Biskies. And this person right here is Bisky. Um, this is Bisky's true form. This is how Bisky really looks physically. She, look, she looks like a brawny, big brawny woman. Um, moving on from that, we get to another section within the story of the Chimera and story. And we run into an old guy uh, that looks like a spider. And he's fighting one of the spiders, um, which is weird. Because uh, this guy is a chimera ant, and he's, his body is half spider. And he ends up fighting the character of one of the spiders um, under Crow Lucifer. Um, so it's weird that this fight happened to begin with. It's kind of amusing that the spider is actually fighting a spider. Um, a verbal spider by name is fighting a literal spider or chimera spider um, in form. So, moving on from that, we get to the next section of the story, and we meet a girl, and this girl is, I believe, ah, gee, what was her name? Um, don't remember. I don't remember. I know the, in the name of the, the king, that eventually he gets born um, from the queen, and the king's name is Meruem, and... Merriam eventually has a match with this girl. And why does he have a chess, a chess match or a shogi match with this girl? It's because in order to beat the country for which he is going to be ruling over and put human beings as slaves and all this stuff for livestock and all this, he has to beat this girl in a, a competition, a shogi competition, or something similar to that. Um, he doesn't really have to do so. All he has to do is kill her. But uh, Meruem, um, the leader of the Chimera, and as the king, um, is a strategist type. Is a Krapika type. Um, he knows the only way to truly make sure that he dominates his enemy is to break them both mentally, physically, and psychologically. Like if he could defeat his strongest enemy, in the thing that the enemy is strongest at. It's a landslide to him because it shows that he can defeat any enemy in any type of job proficiency that they're good at. So that said, he goes into combat with the girl and he loses against the girl. Uh, because she's been doing it for years, and she's actually good at it as well. Not the brightest girl, but he's she's very good at this, and he's not so good. He's he's basically born the other day, 
and decided to start ruling the world. So he has to do a, a good amount of catch up for me as someone who's been playing shogi for years or whatever it is uh, she's playing. Um, but yeah, uh, she did hear some landslide. Um, he says, go away and come back. I'll call you when I need you again. So he's practicing, he's concentrating, and he's going to go get into a next match with someone else. Apparently, in that next match with us, someone else never happens. That guy kills himself. So he tells her to come back so they can have another match. During the process of this, um, Netero and uh, Netero's old rival, um, who's the leader of the Zoldic family, uh, invade this place um, where Merom was hanging out and the other Chimera ants were hanging out in order to destroy um, Meruem and the Chimera ants. And why Netero would even stay in his hand with fighting the Chimera ants um, is because the king, Meruem, is far more powerful than any opponent he's ever fought. In fact, Netero um, Netero knows that only he is equal or stronger or beyond the strength to, in order to take down Meruem. That no one would be strong enough to take him down. Or at least he's at that power level that only people who are super strong can defeat. Um, moving on from that, um, Nesaru then says, um, I have no interest in fighting underlings to basically Merom's underlings, his personal bodyguards, and even his Merom's personal bodyguards, his, the person with the strongest chimera and next to the king are nothing to Nesaru. He tells him to go away. Um, and then we get a nice little backstory of um, Nesaru. And it shows that Netero was actually a martial artist um, when he was very young, which is obvious. Uh, but and the strange part about it is that he was practicing in the snow during the winter season, and he kept practicing in the snow in the spring season, and he kept practicing in the snow um, in the summer season, and he kept practicing in the snow. Um, all the way to the next season. And that, when I meant the next season, winter passed, or should I say winter came again. And then after that, it went back into spring again. So we're here again. Um, a full cycle passed. More than a year has passed. In fact, I believe in Hunter Hunter, it basically says a full two years Netero was in the forest, in an open plain, practicing and training for full two years. No bathroom breaks. Only thing he did was sleep. He didn't eat anything. At least it's assumed that he never ate anything. He just used his um, nan abilities, his key, in order to give him energy so he could do his activities day to day so he would never have to be famished he would never have to be hungry about eating never have to think about eating or think about anything else or even thinking about going to a restroom because every part of his body and everything in his body was an essential component necessary for giving him more energy so his nan basically kept him alive for a full year of pure energy without him ever needing to do anything or eat anything. The, about the most he had to do was go to sleep. That's all. And eventually he got to a level of strength that's so powerful that he was able to um, defeat every martial arts school within Japan. Like everyone, he went to every one of them, he beat every one of them easily, easily beat them. Um, that after that period, he then transitioned from the past into more current events. And this image represents the combination of decades upon decades of Netero's power. 
that each decade that passes, he becomes more powerful and more powerful. So here are nothing but little flashes of light coming down on the earth. And each of those little flashes of light coming down from the earth are sprang through naturals and men. And each of those little lights coming down on this little location here um, onto the earth are basically energy of pure destruction. Uh, you could basically call them all mini meteors. Basically, each one of them represents mini meteors, and there are probably over a hundred, over a hundred of these different little mini meteor types that are crashing towards Earth. And these aren't just regular meteor types; these are pure, pure and then energy, um, pure enhancer. I believe enhancer energy pure energy that's coming down towards earth like meteors um, and yeah um, there's literally hundreds of them hundreds and natural did it all within just a few seconds within just a few seconds of using his hands and different hand gestures he did a whole rain of nothing but pure energy of hundreds of energy with it, within just a few seconds um, Peter never stand a chance and Peto is the character we see falling here um, with the cat tail. And she's basically uh, a chimera ant. And she's not a good chimera ant, she's a very bad chimera ant. Not bad as in she's bad at her job, no bad as in she's uh, evil. And she basically kill Kite. And in the end, uh, revenge will be sweet revenge for Gong against uh, Peto. Um, so what happened in the next coming i say in the next season of hunter hunter or maybe this was towards the end of uh of a season of hunter hunter i don't remember how it goes but um eventually natural got into a fight with miriam slam his powers against miriam miriam got up miriam survived um komogi that's her name i completely forgot her name komogi um, it's damaged in the process, goes into critical condition. Um, one of the bombs from the throw, or the meteors from the throw, or the location that she was in, she gets damaged. Um, uh, Neferpito, or Pito, tries to save her using her powers in order to further her health, um, which was critical. And during the process of Pito trying to save um Komogi's health, Komogi's life. Um Netero continues to fight against Marion in order to destroy him, the Chimera Ant leader, who's become a problem to the human species. And in this fight he loses um not terribly but he just loses. Um actually now I think about it, he did lose terribly. Um because Merum kept his both his arms and both his legs and had a certain amount of energy to spare. Um, so no matter how powerful uh, Netero had become, um, and he had become extremely powerful and extremely dangerous to anyone on the planet, um, he was still no match for the king. Evolution to thousands of years upon thousands of years of the Chimera and lineage had passed through um, the king and evolution. Basically, that's what Merwin says. It's evolution. Evolution from one step to the next step to the next step. And eventually he loses, gets one leg off, gets one arm off, moving process to the next step. From the next step, it went to... Um, uh, Merwin was talking about the location from the survival of his species and the ruling of the planet. So moving on from that, get to the next section, description of that evolution. So that was that section, and moving on from that, uh, it goes into more description of the evolution. Um, basically from amoebas to um, anthropods to... Um, I forgot what was the name of them. Not anthropods. Um, uh, Cambrian life. Cambrian life. 
and moving on from Cambrian life to the evolution from Cambrian life into amphibious life, and from Cambrian to amphibious, and from amphibious to um, land carnivorous, um, and to eventually evolve the chimera. And so that was basically evolution that Merum was describing um, to Netero in that case. Um, unfortunately for him, um, Netero basically stated that uh, human beings are more complicated than you think, and there's far more that's going on than you could possibly imagine. And certain information was then passed on from one from one person to the next, with regards to the survival of each each species, and uh, it's not completely clear on what else Netro said, except he did say one thing, and that was, um, you don't understand the depths of the human heart, and from there. Uh, I believe I believe he pierced a section of his heart with his fingers, um, which initiated a, a signal for a bomb to go off. And once that signal for that bomb went off, um, natural exploded, and thus that bomb went off and it destroyed him, and it destroyed Marowan. Now this is not a regular bomb. This is uh, a nuclear explosion, and this nuclear explosion um, is a mini, what is called a mini rose. That was the description to describe it. It was a mini rose, and this mini rose is, um, I guess you could say, is half the yield of an actual nuclear bomb. It's stronger than a Scud, uh, scud missile, um, which could take a... a I guess three or four city blocks. Um, this mini rose is uh, far stronger than Scud. I could take out about three or four city blocks. So I would say this mini rose could probably take out about an entire town. Yeah, I would say an entire town or an entire village. Um, in order to get clear of this, you would have to be thousands of miles away from the blast radius. So, yeah, I would say if you were to drop this, the many rows on a city, it would definitely take out an entire city. Not a state, but a city itself. Um, more than a mile, more than five miles, probably more than ten miles of property would probably get damaged if you were to use this. But it's called the mini rose because it's not meant to destroy anything larger than a specific um, small area. Like if you were to drop this on a small island, the small island probably would wouldn't be completely destroyed. It's just uh, half the section of that small island would get destroyed. Um, yeah. That said, moving on from that into the next section, we see going finding kite, kite lying on the ground. Um, Gon finally dis discovering that Kite is dead, Gon going into his berserker form, um, or supposedly going into his berserker form, and it's assumed from the first time we met Gon to the first fr from him first passing his first test and going into his next examination, second examination, was the first sign of something is not right with Gon. So. Um, Flushing this character out has evolved past the exams into Red Island, into where we are right now. Um, and Gon's little energy inside his body erupts. The rage of his hatred grows. And that fear that uh, Zushi's master um, had towards Gon, that scared that something might be awakened inside of him, um, is now identified within um, the Chimera Ant um, arc. And I guess within 300 and something episodes, and probably th episode 3, I can't lock down the episode, but it was more than 300, in, more than 300 and something episodes in. So Gone um, Dark, 
internal power finally comes through. And it not only comes through, it starts to metamorphosize him. Um, and he grows and his body matures and he very much becomes a bisky type. Um, and what's weird about his character is that his hair is linked towards the focal point of his power. Um, when he is just a kid, his hair just looks like a spiky hair. But the power seems to come directly through his hair alone into his body. Or his hair is what's connected towards where the power is coming from. Because the anime basically shows that his hair goes directly up into the sky and stays up into the sky. And there's no end point for where it begins or where it actually ends. Because the anime does not show um, if it ends at all. It just goes upwards. Moving on from that, the next scene we see is after um, Gon wins in a fight against uh, Pito. After realizing that Pito was the one that just killed Kite, uh, Gon went and killed Pito for killing Kite. Um, he then realized that he does have this type of darkness in him. That he could straight up kill someone, so... After killing Pito uh, and realizing he's used a vast amount of power in order to do so, because normal Kid Gon couldn't have defeated Pito in in his wildest dreams, he couldn't do it. I mean, he would be able to probably put up a fight, but he wouldn't be able to defeat Pito any more than he's able to defeat Anzo. Um, so it would have been a last slide in Pito's favor. So the price that he had to pay in order to obliterate Pito and for Pito to be a joke to him is high price. And after using said powers and stop using said powers, um, he started to feel the effects of this. And eventually he passes out. His body shrivels up into a prone, um, but not before taking out Pito and basically nuking the site. Um, by using his uh, rock, paper, scissors technique. Um, so that said, that happens. And then the next scene that happens um, is not really a scene, but a couple of episodes thereafter is seeing the world government of the human world government decided in order to defeat the Chimera Ants, they can't physically beat them. So the only way to actually beat the Chimera Ants is they can't physically beat them is to poison them. Not the, the type of poison that you will poison due to suffocation or resistance against poison. Um, that type of poison. No, this type of poison is more like disease, not a poison that you could hold your breath against or you could not put into your body and it won't harm you. This is more like disease that as long as you can breathe, and you can breathe in air, then you will eventually die because you could breathe in air. Because the, the disease itself is harmless against human beings. If human beings breathe in their breath and they exhale, it wouldn't do anything to them because the damn disease is specifically attached towards things that are off chimera ant bloodline and only off chimera ant bloodline. If you are a chimera ant, you're screwed because the thing specifically attacks your blood. And there is no cure for it because it's not something that you can resist. It's more, it's like very much like AIDS or cancer. But it's something that's beyond the, st the normal stages. It's not stage two cancer, it's stage four cancer. You start to die immediately. Um, the effects are tripled um, over time. And since Marion is strong enough to resist it compared to his other followers and his personal bodyguards, he is the last person to go before he's completely dead um, from this disease. So the world government managed to win against the Chimera Ants, um, not in the last slide, but simply in um, a tactic that the ants didn't think that they were able to do and do successfully. 
they all automatically assume that human beings were stupidos and they couldn't defeat them no matter even if it was based on um, a gamble of wits or a gamble of you know strategy with regards to using your mind because chimera ants aren't all physical types either there are, very, there are some scientists that are actually chimera ant types unfortunately for them they couldn't think of a counter acting agent that they could create in time enough to fight against the disease the cure of the chimera ants from the disease it's one of those type of disease that it only kills you within a few hours not a few days not a few months but only within a few hours so if you're able to find out a cure for this it would have to be a cure that you could find out within a few hours not a day or two days or even a week it would have to be something you find out within just a few hours um, that said the king dies from the disease and moving on to the next form of the the last arc that I will speak on that's the chimera and is and the shortest one before I end this video because each upload of um, the five best animes of 2023 of all times are all going to be cut into sections this is the number one anime um, that's on my list section the next two animes are going to be number two and three. So for this video, it's purely about the entire season of Hunter x Hunter. Um, before it went into more readapted um, 2017, our rechanneled version or redone version, the original Hunter x Hunter um, story. And if you're interested in this Hunter x Hunter story, you could proceed forward. If not, you can skip and go to the next um, video that I will be uploading later on um, during the week with regards to the top five enemies. Um, this is just my number one. So this next and final arc is related to um, Killua's sister, um, Nanika. Um, or should I say Nanika is the entity that's in Aluka's body. And Alka is Kilowa's sister. And Alka is Kilowa's cute little sister. Um, and she has a monster inside of her. And this monster is said to have come from the Grand uh, Continent or the Dark Continent. And it's called a Dark Continent because all forms of dark creatures are there on the Dark Continent. And you know, all forms of dark creatures aren't exactly dark creatures. That are classified as creatures associated with things that you would normally identify logically. If uh, a person has a USB stuck inside of their head and it's not used as an antenna, it's simply used as you know um, a popcorn maker. That type of craziness. That's what I'm talking about. Um, that's the dark continent what is identified as logical and and meaningful and reasonable and rational does not apply in the dark continent um, that place is very much Jojo Bazaar type wacky but not wacky to the form that it's Looney Tunes wacky but wacky to the form that it does not make sense how those things operate on normal scientific sense but still are applied to those scientific senses like Aluka's um, creature inside of her is called Nanika um, and Nanika feeds off attention attention towards her the thing that she wants to make her feel happy um, the thing that she wants to make her feel satisfied um, attention and this is a attention demon or an attention monster and this monster only can exist if you give it attention it, you could basically call the thing that's within Aloka uh, a puppy 
that wants attention all the time. And as long as you give it attention, it will give you back power in order to acquire said attention. Because that's the only thing it wants in order to feed on it so it could give you back what you want. It would give you what you want if you give it what it wants. Attention is what makes this thing powerful. The more attention you give to it, the more power you receive in return. It's very weird. And so Nanika um, basically takes over Arko's body and eventually Silva's Kilua's father wants to kill this thing uh, because it's very much a thing. Uh, every time uh, every time Aloka turns into Nanika, her eyes go completely black like she's from another planet or something, or her eyes represents a depth beyond the scope of normal comprehension. Um, that she could pull things from, that she could probably pull things from mid-air that wouldn't exist under any normal logical situation. And Selva wants to kill it because Helva knows that this thing will eventually be the ruin of Killua's family bloodline or their household for the remainder of years as long as Alaka is this Nanika will exist and as long as Nanika exists that threat will always be there and eventually will be the death of the family the death of the Zolding family now what's clear in the manga as well as in the anime is that Silva um, Killua's father is not a good person. I don't think he's ever been a good person. I don't think there's anything to hint that he's a good person. What he is is a clever fox, if not for anything else. Um, he knows how to use other people in order to get what he wants, or how to use a circumstance to his advantage in order to get what he wants. He is very much the brute type because when he's in fighting, he used pure brute strength. But when he's not fighting, he used pure tactics, chest move pieces. And in this situation, um, wanting to kill Aloka in order to kill Nanika shows the Killua that his father is someone that will kill any member of the family if that family member threatens the civility of the family itself. And that's what makes him not a good person whatsoever at all. It's not just all the assassination techniques he does in treating the family um, coldly and as well as uh, making all of them become assassins as well as people work with them to become assassin types and to be cold and calculative when it comes to doing any type of duty or executions in order to survive and to keep the name of the family going. Um, he's the type that understands that if something needs to be done, someone has to do it. And since apparently maybe someone young to him had died a long time ago, that completely turned him from this type of person to another type of person. Whatever that is, Silva, um, is no longer, I would say, you could say to be human um, in any sense of the form. Either his power has made him become this type of alien type of person to his family and to himself, or he has never been that type of person from the beginning. Like, he's always probably been a power-hungry type. None of this is known. All that is known is that Silva isn't a good person. And... He wants to kill Aloka in order to kill Nanika. However, um, that never happened. Um, Aloka got saved and managed to escape with Killua to go see Gon, who was in the hospital trying to recover from the injuries from killing Pito. Um, and Killua needs to revive Gon because if Gon, he doesn't revive Gon, he will allow Gon to die from his injuries, and that's not who Killua is, that's not who Kropika is, that's not who Leora is, and that's not who Gon is. 
Um, so in the next scene, we see Leroy going to be um, take up the mantle for uh, Natero. At least he's going to join in a vote to be whoever should take Natero's place as the leader within the Hunter Association. And he believes that this is a good thing to do um, since certain certain things within the Hunter Association is off balance and it needs strong leadership at the moment. They don't really need him because he's not the strongest, but he believes that um, he's the only one confident enough in order to follow through from beginning, middle, and end more than anyone else. Um, not sure if that's true, but that's what he truly believes. Um, he then is seen in this next scene meeting a guy named Gin. Um, he doesn't fully know Gin whatsoever at all, but he knows what from Gun what Gun says that his name is Gin or Gene. Um, so once he realized that this guy name is Gene, he automatically sees that he looks somewhat like Gene. I mean, like um, Luffy. I was just about to say Luffy. It looks almost like. Um, uh, always like going and realizing that uh, he looks almost like going decides like okay screw this guy um, he doesn't care about his own son I've had it with this I'm going to use my powers that I just gained in order to knock this guy out so he gives this guy an uppercut he went flying and eventually towards the end of coming towards the end of the manga we get to the point where Aloka um, sees Gon and uh, Kilowatt asks Aloka to go away so that Nanika could come forward in her body. And once that happens, he then asks Nanika to revive Gon from death or near death. Um, and in, in this situation, it's, it's clear how much the damage took a hold of Gon. Um, Gon used every single amount of energy in his body possible in order to transform. And he literally turned into a shriveling prune. Um, but that's no problem for Nanika. She just heals him. Um, it took a while, but she just did it anyway. And that was the end of that. And then the next scene we see is Crazy Lomi standing on top of a building, um, realizing that Nanika just used her powers in order to bring Gon back from the grave, from the dead. Knowing that uh, Aloka can do this, can bring, bring someone back from the dead, um, Ilomi knows, knows that he has to have this power for himself. And this is the first time we ever seen Ilomi go this crazy and sadistic and nuts and one can only assume that this is just something that's passed on from him and others who serve under Sulfur's thumb um, that there might be something with regards to his past that's been fleshed out or emphasized that has not been emphasized before for the reason why he's so desperate in order to get the Dragon Balls which is natural anyone would if they want to become strong and if they want to attain fame, fortune, everything. Um, but we don't know what his intentions truly are. Uh, so that said, I'm going to come to a close with regards to this anime real quick. So the next scene, last of the next scene, before I close things out with regards to uh, Hunter Hunter, is Gon shows up after he's fully revived into the Grand Amphitheater Hall, um, says to uh, says to Leorio, uh, he's fine. Leorio crying and sobbing, realizing that Gon is alive when he thought Gon was never going to come back to life or, or ever recover whatsoever at all. Um, they hug it out, and eventually, Jean, he, uh, Gon meets Jean and have a conversation with, her, uh, with his father. And Jean tells Gon that you could go up on top of uh, the great tree and he will be up there on the great tree a day from now or something like that. Um, so Gon says, uh, or 
Gene says, like, if you can meet me up there by yourself uh, a day from now, um, I'll tell you everything you need to know. And we'll have a long conversation as well. So that said, Cohen goes about his business and everyone else goes about their own business and Gene goes about his own business. And we see Gene walking away um, from many people who got their ass kicked within the amphitheater who wanted to jump him for not going after going to take care of his kids. So he kicked everybody's ass in the amphitheater before he peaced out. Um, the next scene we see is um, Kite reborn inside of a little girl. And this little girl has pink hair and wearing a leather jacket outfit. Um, I really don't know where she came from. I can't remember. But I know that that's Kite. Um, so from the dead, back to life. Don't know how that works. Um, I can only assume that uh, something happens once the king was dead or someone that within the Hunter Association brought him back to life or did something with his body that come back to life or some type of swapping happened with one of the chimera ants. Still a little fuzzy with regards to how Kite is um, in a woman's body or in a girl's body, but so on and so forth. Um, Gon, Kilowa, and uh, Aloka travel um, to the village close to where, where Gon was told that the great tree was that he had to meet his father. They travel there. Gon says he's going to go up by himself, climbs the tree by himself, um, see the various different people climbing it as well. Unfortunately for them, they don't have chakra, or not in the sense, not chakra. They don't have um, 10, so they can only go so far where Gon can use 10 in order to stay on for as long as he's like. Um, that said, see what else uh, that said um, he kept going up and eventually all the way up he meets Jin and him and Jin have a little conversation around these weird looking birds um, in this bird nest and they look onto the land and on, uh, over the sky and on, onto the atmosphere and the atmosphere surface and they talked about their past they talk about the adventures they had they talk about uh, the people they met and eventually, Jane tells Gon about this island called the Dark Continent. And Gon is informed that the Dark Continent is a place where not only many creatures exist, but um, the powers that they all have. Uh, the energy of Nen um, that's found in every life form is more prominent within the creatures that are within the Dark Continent. They don't know the creatures of the dark continent. Some creatures of the dark continent don't know where this great energy and great power came from. And some of them don't even believe in it whatsoever at all. Um, while others know fully well what it is due to information passed to them or they just randomly learn it. But it's assumed that majority of the different creatures within um, the, grand, the dark continent are stupid creatures, but not all of them are. The cat marines certainly weren't. Um, moving on from that, we then see a scene with uh, Mito and getting a postcard, I believe, from Gun, where Gun went. Um, and moving on from that one, we see the last of the last with regards to these. I, I believe this is the last image. We see Netero um, saying goodbye to his friends and he was the last of the strongest of everyone within the Hunter Hunter. Actually, now think about it, he was the only person that's the strongest person in all of Hunter Hunter from the very beginning to all the way to the very ending. Um, no one really evolved strong enough to beat him to, from the very beginning all the way to the end. So um, at the end, they left him a bottle of champagne and a glass champagne as well and that's probably going to stay there for quite some time before someone moves there moves the champagne glass and the champagne itself and replace it with another one uh, depending on how long they are going to celebrate Netero's um, 
time period away from everyone else due to dying, obviously. Um, and that said, uh, the last scene that's shown within Hunter Hunter, or the last few scenes that are shown within, uh, within Hunter Hunter before the credits roll, is Aluka and Killua searching the world using their pad for various different adventures they're going on because they're now out of the house and they're going to anywhere they want to go to. And then scene after that shows the Ario inside of his room uh, doing his studies. And since he's already a doctor, he doesn't have to worry about that. So he's keeping track of his friends from his room. And the next scene of the last of the characters, or should I say, Gohan's the last of the characters, but second to last of the characters, that are seen is Kropika. Um And Kropika collects as many eyes as he can, uh, many crimson eyes, and he's just waiting. He's either waiting for the time for the way he kills his enemy or waiting for the time to um, pass, where he could consider moving all the eyes to a specific safe place so no one would ever touch them ever again. Um, I have a feeling that Kropika is going to go back to his original hometown uh, and do original hometown things and rebuild the population of his people. Um, that I don't fully know of, but I know that's the vibe I'm getting. Perhaps that's the vibe that the others within the ship are getting as well. Um, I guess I said ship. Uh, I think I might be getting a little tired here. I'm talking about ships now. Um, so yeah, I would say that's the end of Hunter Hunter, and the last last scene um, is going seen on the right and father seen on the left. In the English uh, translation, he says something totally different. And in the Japanese translation, he says something totally different. Um, in Japanese translation, he says, um, I'm always in search for something I can never have. Because the thing I've always wanted is, is something that's um, not in front of me something like that um, so it's never fully clear what that meant so it's I guess it's up to you the reader or the viewer or uh, I guess you decipher the subtitles to tell what what is and what isn't you can tell um, what it is that Gene probably meant by this uh, it, it basically means what you think it should mean to you um, as well as the story itself. What does Hunter Hunter mean to you? So that's the end of this video with regards to Hunter Hunter. It's two hours and 30 minutes long. Even if I had cut this video for Hunter Hunter down to 30 minutes and it was just a two hour video, where I'm talking about a whole series here of many things within the Hunter Hunter, many episodes, more than, more than 300 plus episodes for Hunter Hunter itself for the original 1999 anime and the remade version that was in 2017 I believe um, which followed the same map formula um, with some extra stuff added along the way but um, yeah anything that's a long-term anime will take hours to do yes you can knock it out with just saying this happened here, this happened there, this happened there, this happened there, and that happened there, and get it done within just like 25 to 30 minutes. But I went over the entire series, and I'll do the same for the next one tomorrow, um, which will also be uploaded tomorrow, is One Piece. I mean, One Piece is far longer than this, so the video of One Piece is probably going to be like three hours long. Um, but that's to be expected of something called the top five animes of uh, August and September of 2023. Um, but not the top five animes of August 2023 that were released in August and September of 2023. 
I'm talking about the top five greatest anime of all time to watch in 2023 of August and September. Um, I said August is gone, September. Um, yeah, so the first on this list was Hunter Hunter. Uh, it's my number one, and it's still today my number one. It's my go-to when I watch anything um, that I want to watch that's a little complicated, that doesn't have a lot of goofiness in it, and takes itself seriously, but at the same time, doesn't take itself seriously. He knows when to pull away to remove the seriousness from it, and at the same time knows when to double down on what's serious in order to make things feel more intense and more um, cost effective and more price. You have to pay the price for these actions. Cause and effect. Causality. So that's it for this. And um, tomorrow will be the next video. And that one will be One Piece. Oh yes, the positives and the negatives. I almost forgot. This hardly have any negatives, um, but it have many positives. But if I was to identify this as having negatives, I would say some stories were um, over-exaggerated um, and could have been fleshed out a little or cut down a little so that other arcs could have existed to be much stronger. The Green Island arc wasn't that good of an arc because it tried to be more than what it was. It was trying to be that foundation with those curvatures and those land masses and those buildings and all these different things that were developed to be uh, Green Island. But it failed in that attempt because uh, I guess you could say the notion of playing a game, a card game, where the stakes is your life. It's a hard sell uh, when it comes to an anime about hunting. It's hard for people to identify the word hunting in the sense of using your mind or your body with the attachment towards a game about cards. So that was the problem with regards to Greed Island. How could you sell a, that type of story to your audience and have it be compelling enough to keep going for episode after episode after episode after episode without it getting boring? For the most, I believe the Green Island arc should have been six episodes long. That's all. Nothing more. Maybe seven. Maybe a seven, but nothing longer than seven. Rita Island arc should have really been seven out, um, seven episodes most. And the second thing about um, Hunter Hunter that wasn't, I would say that wasn't good, um, was a Chimera Ant. Um, during the Chimera Ant saga, a lot of things started to become convoluted. There seemed to be repetitive episodes, um, but there were fashion on top of each other to seems like they were actually new but they felt repetitive and some of the episodes um, had pointless stories um, extra fighting and extra combat with useless enemies that didn't serve anything towards the overall story so that's what I didn't like about the Chimera and story some stories weren't necessary and some characters were not necessary to be in the Chimera and, and Saga. So just those two were just those two things were um, off for me. And that's all I gotta say with regards to uh, my best anime of 2023, Hunter Hunter. Um, every time I watch it, it gets even better as as, as I go along. Um, I'm not gonna put uh, Hisoka's whole perversity thing as part of one of those bad things for me because it's not something that he does constantly every single time. If it was something he do did constantly every single time, it would have been a nuisance. It's something he does every now and again. I don't like it any more than I like I, I, The same way I don't like um, vinegar, 
I have the smell of vinegar. Um, I don't like the character whatsoever at all. Um, but I also know that the character is essential towards certain things. Uh, actually, that's untrue. I do like this character. I do like Hisoka. Um It would be kind of stupid to not like Hisoka. I just don't like how they use perversity as a way to state that he he's this type of person. It's unnecessary. To be honest with you, whether he have it or not, it wouldn't have changed the story of his guy whatsoever at all. When I think of his guy, and I think this is, um, you know, liking for boys and stuff, uh, I don't see that whatsoever at all. Even if I did see it, um, when all that nonsense goes away and he decides to get serious, um, it's fine. It works. Because whether you have something attached to a character, or not attached to our character, it still work in the Hunter x Hunter universe. You could have the guy being a prick in Hunter x Hunter, and the next moment you could have the guy being a saint in Hunter x Hunter, and it would still work. Because the writer, uh, writers of Hunter x Hunter, or the showrunners of Hunter x Hunter, and even the, the artists of Hunter x Hunter, especially the artist and the writer, knows how to, they know how to use the character to its full potential either going one way or going the other way and that's something I've always liked with regards to Hunter x Hunter and that's all I'm going to say with regards to Hunter x Hunter I don't want this to be a three hour long video um, those were my cons uh, my pros are everything that I didn't say as my cons and that's why it's my number one I basically only have like three problems with it I really only have two problems with it, but if I really want to put in the whole Hisoka thing in there, um, it would be three. And for any sh anything to have two company three as a crowd, three being the most you should ever have, with an issue towards anything, like then it's a perfect enemy. Like if it had hit four or five issues that I found that were annoying as well. Then it would have been in the second slot for the second best anime of all time. But since it only has like three issues for me, pacing wasn't one of the problem. Uh, it only re it really only had like three issues for me whatsoever at all. Um, you know, sometimes this over sexualized suggested things. Uh, we could say which is also associated with Isaka or with the Chimera Ants. You know, and the whole Greed Island and the whole Chimera Ant saga. Technically, three things throughout the entire Hunter x Hunter universe. That's it. That's all. Nothing else. Other enemies, the middle, the other enemies would be lucky if they could only find three things and three things only. Yes, I could find other things wrong with Hunter x Hunter. I could find things wrong with what Gon is wearing. I could find on same thing. Uh, certain things wrong with what he's what he's saying, what he's doing, where he's moving, within the animation of the body, within continuity, within uh, the sound effects. I could find every small detail with regards to Hunter x Hunter that's wrong. Um, but this is not a video about that. This is a video about the major issues, the major pros, the major cons, and whether Hunter x Hunter is good enough to watch or not, or if you could, something you could skip over. Like, Hunter x Hunter is not something you skip over. Hunter x Hunter is something in the top five. Even if you don't have it as your number one, it'll always be in the top five. It will never be Jujutsu, Jujutsu Kaisen in the top five. It will never be My Hero Academia in the top five, because those animes, I've seen both of those, they're missing certain essential pieces in order to rise above the rest. Something, Hunter x Hunter have something that other animes don't have. Just like Dragon Ball Z have something that other fighting animes can never have. That's reason why Dragon Ball Z is the number one fighting anime. It just has that certain gusto things that's necessary. So I'm going to end it here. So I don't have to talk even more, but 
if you want to know what's the number one anime of all times, it's either Hunter x Hunter or it's One Piece. That's all I can say. If I'm totally wrong about Hunter x Hunter being the number one anime, based on the assessment of everything that you could possibly think of, both reality and fantasy, if it's not Hunter x Hunter, then it's One Piece. It's just that simple. If you have anything other than One Piece or Hunter x Hunter as your number one, then I won't say you don't know anything, but I'm saying, but I'll say you you just haven't been digging or searching hard enough, or you haven't explored the realm of what is anime hard enough. So I'll leave it there, and that's going to this is going to be my first video that I upload for. Um, August September anime to watch of 2023 obviously I should just put it as September anime 2023 but um, it really isn't this anime was intended for August but it's coming in early September simply because of technical issues that's all but it was already set up and meant to be released in August so that's it for this one Tomorrow will be the next video.